All right, hello everyone. I'm uh, Jeremiah Johnson. I'm the current chair of the Young Neurosurgeons Committee. Welcome to the Young Neurosurgeons NREF webinar. Today we're on episode 11, Designing Your Neurosurgery Residency Elective Middle Years. Um, we want to uh, transition a little bit from a lot of medical student-centric content to a little bit more resident-centric content. And this will be the first of our Designing Your Advanced Training series. And uh, we're gonna go ahead and get started and people can join in as, as they can. Um, so for those of you who are unfamiliar with what the Young Nurses Committee is, um, it's, it's a committee of, uh, of the AANS. And um, the goal of the web series that we put on is to provide students and residents and young nurse surgeons with timely information, education, and inspiration towards a career in neurosurgery. The Young Nurse Surgeons Committee itself is a group of uh, residents, um, a handful of medical students, and some early year career attendings. We're generally considered young nurse surgeons until we pass our ABNS boards, which is about three to five years after finishing your residency training. Um, this group of people are elected nationally and um, represent the AANS our young nurse surgeons to the AANS. We, our goal is to develop future leaders of nurse surgery and provide a channel for young nurse surgeons to impact the direct direction of our specialty. Um, and that's our goal. Uh, so what is the AANS you may ask? Cause 90 years old now, um, it is, uh, stands for the American Association of Neurological Surgeons. It's a scientific and educational association with more than 10,000 members worldwide. It's uh, an organization that guides the field of neurosurgery and its roles include education, advocacy, promoting the highest quality patient care. Um, and we're all happy to be a part of that. INREF is an educational research foundation and is part of AANS. It's a 501c3 corporate corporation. Um, it supports basic science, clinical research, as well as lifelong education to foster improved outcomes for our patients with neurological diseases. They offer also support many research awards to residents uh, and students, as well as uh, courses for surgical skills that are extremely beneficial to uh, residents and medical students and young attendings, including this endeavor, which we're very thankful for them for sponsoring us. Um, today, uh, one quick note is to follow us on social media for both uh, future webinar announcements, uh, other things related to young neurosurgeons, as well as link to uh, the YouTube version of this webinar, which will be posted either later this week or early next week. So in case you missed it or wanna watch it again or share it with someone, you can find it on our InRef YouTube uh, and Young Resurgeon page. Our featured guest today is Dr. Marr, Cormac Marr. He is a professor in the Department of Neurosurgery at the University of Michigan. He's the residency program director there. His subspecialty interest is in pediatric neurosurgery, but also does adult neurosurgery. Uh, as I understand it. Uh, he's a distinguished young nurse surgeons alumni. We were just talking about the, the committee and its evolution since his time on the committee. Um, we're proud to have him here. Um, his neurological training was, uh, he did a residency at Mayo Clinic Rochester, his pediatric fellowship at Boston Children's Hospital in Harvard. And then he did his cerebrovascular fellowship at Brigham's Women and Children's Hospital, also Harvard affiliated. And one of his many accomplishments is, includes uh, being the editorial board of Journal of Neurosurgery Pediatrics. Dr. Marr, thank you for joining us. Really a pleasure to have you. Yeah, thanks, uh, Jeremiah, for that uh, that kind introduction. And it's really great to uh, to be here uh, with all of you today. Uh, as we were talking about uh, right before this seminar got started, the the YNC I think has had a remarkable growth uh, over the last few years. I think uh, you know thanks to your leadership and others. Uh, that have, that were your immediate predecessors, and it, it's certainly a much uh, different organization than it was uh, ten or fifteen years ago. And and I think uh, is carrying out some really important functions out there right now, speaking for for young neurosurgeons and uh, as well as uh, the interests of medical students and, and residents as well. So so uh, good work, and I'm very glad to to be here with you today. That's great. I would want to interject before uh, you get started here um, that we have three other guests, which we'll talk after, Dr. Mar as well as if you have questions for him or the other guests, you can put it into the um, chat function or Q&A function, I'm sorry, of Zoom. Um, and, uh, and we have an inter interactive time towards the end of the, after the talks. So we can, we can field some questions and even maybe get people to get people's questions answered either in person or in text. So we can do both, both ways, but just to let people know there'll be some time for interaction at the end. Yeah, thanks, Jeremiah. 
Um, so I was asked to speak today very briefly uh, on neurosurgery residency, in particular, the middle re uh, years or the so-called research uh, years in residency, and just give a few examples of, of how we do it in my program, uh, as well as some of the, the issues uh, with this around the country. Uh, let's see. It's not advancing. There we go. So I have no disclosures. So uh, over the next uh, 10 or 15 minutes, I'm just gonna talk about what the rules are that govern neurosurgery residency, uh, in particular, the elective time, uh, what your options are as, as uh, residents uh, planning for your elective time, and then just give a few examples. So first of all, the rules, who sets the rules? Well, the ACGME, uh, and uh, the Neurosurgery RRC, Residency Review uh, Committee, uh, set the rules for neurosurgical training. And obviously, uh, we are all uh, in our uh, individual residency programs uh, obliged to follow their, uh, their set guidelines. In addition to that, when we're talking about elective time, we need to talk about some subspecialty training options that have arisen. Uh, and that is now governed by the CAST committee, uh, which I'm on, the Committee for Advanced Subspecialty Training, which is part of the Society for Neurological Surgeons. And now they have, a, I think, a strong and supportive relationship with the American Board of Neurological Surgery, uh, which in turn will govern the certification of these individuals after that subspecialty training period. So the ACGME sets the rules. What are the rules? Well, essentially they've decided that neurosurgical training has to be 84 months, seven years, 54 months of that is clinical neurosurgical education, which I've uh, illustrated for you in the subheadings. And then 30 months are really unaccounted for. The ACGME's guideline for that, they say the remaining months of the program may be used for elective rotations or research. Uh, so very much up to the individual programs. Now they do note that if there's a permanent elective within a neurosurgery training program that that must be approved in advance by the RRC. And a permanent elective is essentially something that all the residents are gonna do in that program. Uh, so an additional year of training that all the residents are gonna do. But individual elective time for individual residents is essentially not governed by the uh, RRC uh, in the same way. So what does that mean, practically speaking? Well, traditionally what it's meant is that within a seven year program, somewhere in the middle of the residency, in our program, it's years four and five, we have a research uh, or elective time. These days, everybody calls it academic development time because of its more uh, general descriptive nature. Until very recently, there was the additional option of instead of say doing two years of research, you could do one year of research and one year of a so-called unfolded clinical fellowship, which I've shown in this second example here. With in both of these examples, the chief year still in the, the seventh year. So this was, I would say our model uh, uh, in the past uh, and something that we've been very happy with. There have been some recent changes though that are very important for residency programs to take into account. And that's essentially a change that the Committee uh, for Advanced Subspecialty Training, has, uh, the CAST Committee, uh, has made uh, with uh, the ABNS. Essentially what they've done is that they've said if unfolded fellowships are going to count as a fellowship that will be recognized by the ABNS, it has to happen after the completion of the chief year. And that the chief year can occur in years six or seven. So practically speaking, if people want an unfolded fellowship starting after this July, the chief year must be in PGY six and the unfolded fellowship must be in PGY seven. They can do any kind of subspecialty training they want during the elective years prior to those years, but it won't count as an official CAST accredited unfolded fellowship. There's two exceptions to that. One is neurocritical care. And the new rule as of very, very recently is that it has to occur after PGY-4. So that's a little bit different than the others, uh, which are six or seven. And then the first year of the two-year endovascular training uh, can occur uh, earlier in the residency as well. So two uh, relatively limited exceptions to this PGY-7 and folded fellowship year. This is a relatively new rule and programs have had to adapt. So again, the old models elective time in the middle of residency years four or five, chief year PGY-7. Well, if programs are interested in doing unfolded fellowships in their residency, the new model 
essentially has been mandated uh, to be this, this third option that I've shown you here. You have one year of elective time uh, wherever you want it. Most programs somewhere around three or four. Chief year, PGY six, and then your enfolded fellowship year, uh, PGY seven. So some programs are going to this model and some programs are not. At the um, Society for Neurological Surgeons meeting a couple of years ago, I thought it was interesting. There was sort of an informal straw poll in the room of how many programs would move to the new model with the chief year in six and the elective uh, time in, in seven. And, uh, and some programs certainly were interested in it, but a large number of them were not interested in making this change. So I think it'll be interesting over the next few years to see which programs move uh, in which direction. And I think to some extent, uh, this will be predicated on what the residency program goals are uh, for the residents that they train. Uh, are they interested in training uh, mostly academicians? Are they interested in training uh, mostly uh, uh, clinical people, private practice people? Um, uh, how invested are they in certain subspecialties and so on? And I think how programs answer that question uh, is going to determine what the program structure is uh, in many locations. Uh, for their academic development time. What programs call it uh, can be illustrated of, uh, illustrative of that too. We tend to call it research time in my program because that's what most people do. Uh, but again, many programs have used the word academic uh, development time as a sort of a euphemism that incorporates research, but also lots of other options that, that people can do. Uh, we try to be an academic program. Almost all of our uh, graduates uh, uh, go on to academic jobs. As these are just in the last eight years. Essentially everybody except for uh, one or two uh, people have gone on to, to get academic jobs. And that's something that, that we pride ourselves on. Um, and I think it's very much a part of our identity as a residency program. So when we look at our, our um, uh, rotation schedule and uh, ask these sorts of questions about what kind of a program we want to be. We frankly decided not to change our schedule. Uh, we thought it was important to have the two uh, consecutive years of research or academic development time in the middle of the residency to leave the chief year in year seven. And uh, if fellowships were uh, necessary uh, or desired, that they could be done uh, at a different site afterwards. So that was a decision that we thought that made sense for our program, given the uh, desire we have uh, to uh, graduate uh, people that are uh, extremely academically oriented. I think that other very good programs will make other decisions uh, for their own uh, good reasons, but that's the decision that we made. And uh, right now we're very comfortable with it. We do revisit that uh, almost annually um, uh, with uh, polls of the faculty and polls of the resident, but that's where we are as a program right now. So that means every resident in our program has two years, PGY four and five uh, for their academic development. Um, I think it's really important to emphasize, though, that that doesn't mean that people aren't doing anything with academic development until they become a PGY-4. It's just the opposite. For people to make the most of these important years, this process really needs to start the second you, you set foot on campus. Uh, and, it, and it really does. We have a mentorship program where all of our residents meet with uh, clinical uh, research mentors, a basic science research mentor, uh, as well as a the program director and the chair in their PGY one year, early in their PGY one year, they meet with those same people six months after that and six months after that and six months after that and so on, hopefully getting progress reports on what their uh, on uh, on what their progress has been with respect to their research goals and their academic development goals. Now, what we see in this process is that the mentors that were assigned early may not be the best mentors for their career goals. And so their mentors might change over time. And that's, that's frankly part of what that mentorship process is, is to say, do you know the right people at the institution to, to achieve your goals? If not, let me introduce you to them. And then maybe they become your mentors going forward. So it's a discernment process. What kind of a person do you wanna be when you graduate from this program? And then how do we help you get there? That's the mentorship process. And again, that has to start early uh, in my opinion. 
once you decide what you're doing with your research time, we encourage you, if, it's, if you're doing basic science research, we encourage you to get started with that early. If, if you can't get into the lab early, at least do background articles early. A lot of our residents have written review articles on the basic work that they're gonna be doing in the early years. We do require residents to make a presentation to the department uh, in the PGY3 year. Uh, about what they're going to be doing with their academic development time, allowing the whole department uh, to essentially ask them questions about it and hopefully mentor them and help them uh, with that process. And, and the plan does have to be approved um, by the program prior to its implementation in years four and five. Now, in general, I like to approve every single thing that the resident can propose as long as they can make a solid case that whatever they've proposed is going to help their academic career. Um, and it can be uh, all sorts of different ideas that the residents can and have come up with. I don't have a preset notion in my mind for what this has to be, but they do have to make a case for whatever they come up with is gonna help their academic career. And then finally, if it is a research experience that the resident is going to have, then we encourage them to, to seek funding. Uh, the institution has an R25 uh, training grant, there's T32 grants. NREF, of course, is very generous uh, with, uh, with training grants uh, for our residents. And then the sections themselves offer training grants. So depending on what the resident's subspecialty interest is, we encourage them all to apply for that. So again, PGY 1, 2, and 3 are are very important years for uh, making preparation for a good and successful uh, PGY four and five uh, experience. I don't want to single out too many of our residents, but I was asked to give just a few examples. And so I thought I'd just look at last year's graduating class. Um, Here's just one example. Todd Holland uh, chose to do some basic science research, worked with one of our prior graduates, uh, Dan Oranger, who's now at uh, New York University doing Raman uh, histology uh, work and, uh, and uh, machine learning, I think has done a really outstanding basic work with that, had uh, publication in uh, Nature Medicine, as well as uh, many other publications, and he has just been recruited to join our faculty. Uh, Brandon Smith chose to do mostly clinical research in his two years. He worked with Dr. Linda Yang, uh, our peripheral nerve uh, faculty member, uh, doing a mini clinical experience uh, with her. He's now doing a, um, a fellowship with Rob Spinner at Mayo Clinic and has um, uh, signed a contract with uh, Duke University to join their faculty uh, in July. Uh, so he did mostly clinical research, clinical work. Um, uh, as well as uh, some uh, basic science work as well. And then Jay Nathan, uh, our third graduate last year, uh, is interested in spine, did uh, a lot of spine uh, clinical research. He's also very interested in politics um, and uh, chose to actually spend uh, some time during his academic development time in the United States Senate as an intern. Uh, working with the uh, Senator uh, from Louisiana, uh, he chose uh, Bill Cassidy, because Bill is Bill Cassidy is a doctor uh, who is a senior member of all of the health committees, and that in particular is what uh, Jay is is interested in. Um, we did a, Sanjay uh, 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 Gupta uh, was one of our prior graduates, also who did a uh, political internship in the past. So we do have, although that's a unusual choice uh, for a neurosurgical resident, we've I think we've had success with that in the past, and did encourage Jay to to do that as well. And then finally, I'll mention that uh, advanced degrees are a possibility with the academic development time. Our current uh, chief resident, David Altshuler, got a, a master's of science degree in his academic development time, which I thought uh, was uh, nicely aligned uh, with the kind of clinical research that he was interested in and wanted to do. Uh, he's going into uh, a future in uh, academic oncology. Uh, and has written some nice papers uh, in that area. And then Matt Wilsey, uh, our current PGY-6, uh, is interested in functional and epilepsy. Uh, he had uh, a very good uh, engineering degree uh, as well as a very good engineering master's degree uh, prior to starting the program, was doing some good, uh, uh, great functional research in our School of Engineering during his two years of basic science research elective time. And, the engineering school actually told him that if he chose to stay for a third year of research, he would uh, be awarded a PhD. And so we spoke about that and uh, decided that that would be in his uh, career best interest, especially considering he's going into functional, which is, I think, a field that really values 
uh, that very highly. So he extended his training by one year to get the PhD. Uh, he would be a chief this year, but as it is, he'll be uh, graduating uh, from the program next year. So just a few quick thoughts uh, to conclude. I do think that uh, although I think it's natural to think of the elective time as perhaps not as important as uh, other times during your residency where you're really learning how to be a neurosurgeon, um, it is probably the most important determinant of what kind of a neurosurgeon you're going to be and how successful, at least the early part of, uh, of your career is going to be. What exactly you should do during your elective time is going to be uh, dependent on a lot of questions, though, that you need to ask yourselves, specialty choice, number one. Um, I gave the example of uh, one of our residents who's interested in functional epilepsy. Well, that's a field that really values basic science research, and I encourage my residents interested in that field to explore those avenues. Uh, tumor, uh, to some extent, also values basic science research a lot, although you can be, I think, successful with a background in basic science research or uh, clinical research in tumor. Uh, vascular tends to be more oriented towards, uh, towards clinical research rather than basic research, but obviously basic researchers are very successful there as well. Pediatrics, a whole different ballgame. Obviously, they do not have any enfolded fellowships. So I would suggest that it's not very valuable to, to do an enfolded fellowship, that it will not be accredited or recognized. So instead, plan on doing a postgraduate fellowship, plan on using your academic development time to do research. I think basic research and clinical research are both uh, valued in that field. Uh, spine uh, it tends to have more clinical researchers uh, involved in that field, although again, the basic research is very important and I'm sure would be very valued uh, as well. So then people need to ask, you know, if I do basic research, will I be going into academics? If the answer is you're probably not going to go into academics, then why would you spend two years in a lab? You'd better off doing, doing something else, uh, such as uh, clinical work, um, uh, uh, more specialty development in the operating room, uh, things outside of, uh, of medicine, like the political examples that I gave you. Uh, for medical students who are on the call, this is a really important, I think, differentiator as you evaluate programs that are a good fit for you. You need to ask about what their academic development time is like, what their plan is for their current residents and how they, what kind of options they would have for you. Uh, one of the most important uh, factors to consider when you're choosing a residency for current residents, obviously uh, for you guys and, and uh, women, it is what it is. You are in your residency program, so you have to work within the constraints of whatever uh, department you're working in and balance your goals with the department strengths. Um, and uh, undoubtedly, you're all in very good programs that have many strengths, and I think playing to those strengths will, will help you out. Future employers in general want to see some focus. Uh, I think for a neurosurgery department chair who's hiring a new faculty member, it's really helpful to be able to read a resume and see that this person has done research that's consistent uh, with their career goals. Um, it doesn't always have to be the case. Don't uh, worry too much if you change your, your mind as a PGY-5 or 6. We've certainly seen that in, in my program, and people uh, have ended up having very successful careers anyway. But if you um, are able to set a career uh, path and make a consistent research plan for yourself, it will, I think, uh, help you out. And then can't emphasize this enough, it's never too early to plan. Um, I always suggest to my residents, start, you know, go backwards, start by imagining yourself in 20 years, you know, what's your most successful career look like? What do you really want to be doing with your life? And then again, working backwards from there, say, okay, what do I need to do to prepare myself to get to that point? And then I think those questions will be uh, easier to answer. Final slide tomorrow is, uh, is the written exam for the ABNS. Those of you who are taking that tomorrow, don't worry, get some sleep tonight. Everything is gonna be fine. And I think that's probably good advice uh, in general for your elective years as well. Um, I think uh, it's, it's really nice when you can have a good plan and when everything falls into place. But if you're a good person and you're working hard, you're probably gonna be very successful no matter what happens in the elective years. So with that, I'll, I'll conclude and uh, I leave some time for the next speaker. So again, thanks very much to the uh, Young Neurosurgeons Committee for the kind invitation to, to speak to you all tonight. Dr. Marr, excellent, excellent job with that overview. And not one word wasted, beautifully communicated. Um, I, I just wanna ask a handful of questions if any of the panelists have any other questions, but the one question I would ask you is if you know, you're a PGY one, two, and even three residents, but let's just say one or two, 
in a program that doesn't have quite as formal of a pathway to designing your middle years. Um, and, the, and you were, hey, I need to start addressing this now situation. What would your suggested next step be for that person? Yeah, so I think identifying mentors is by far the most important uh, thing. And hopefully your residency program has an established uh, situation where you have a mentor. Might not be the right mentor, but that's a conversation you have with your existing mentor. And you say, you know, you're great. Uh, you can, you know, I'm very glad to have your mentorship, but you need to introduce me to somebody that actually has something to do with my chosen career path. Mm -hmm. That's a very important mentorship role. Um, and I, I wouldn't be uh, afraid to, to simply say that, uh, to take, uh, take charge of your career path in, in that way. Uh, if they're not helping you with that, uh, which they should be, then I think you just have to do it on your own. Uh, you know, you're, you're all very successful people that have made it this far. And I think that, you know, there's, there's no harm in just uh, cold calling people and saying you're interested in what I'm interested in. I'd, I'd like to meet with you and, and potentially work with you. Great. Uh, okay, great. There's a there's one question, but we'll just we'll just pause that towards the end and let the other speakers talk. So I think next on our agenda is Dr. Grafeo, who is going to talk about his experience with his uh, his his middle years time or his elective time, so to speak. Can yeah. you guys hear me all right? Equipment up. Yeah, he can hear you. What's that, Jeremiah? Are you going to say something? No, I was just saying you're getting your equipment ready. Yeah, I'm going back and forth between the speakers and the headphones, just uh, trying to optimize the sound quality. But um, anyway, hi, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us tonight. And thank you, Dr. Mayer, for that fantastic presentation that really summarized a lot of the key points that I think kind of going into the the high level thinking about this and um, inform the understanding of really sort of, uh, you know, how the um, ACGME and the, you know, pertinent neurosurgical societies view things, which are obviously the building blocks that all the different programs put into things. Um, you'll hear more from my uh, co-resident Ben Himes uh, shortly, um, but I, you know, I'm a resident at Mayo Clinic. I'm in my seventh year, um, and what I think is one of the great strengths of certainly our residency program um, is that it's got a lot of built-in diversity, and I really liked the way that uh, Dr. Mayer had s described sort of your career advancement years or career development years, and I think that the best way to think about uh, the whole concept of, um, you know, how to plan this elective time is to think of it in terms of what are your career goals and how can you use this time to advance those goals as much as possible, and I'm going to sort of give you, you know, my take on things um, in terms of what I was looking for and, you know, how I use the tools available to me to, to try to achieve that. Um, ben will give you another version of it, but I think it's a very interesting point that if you look at my class, the class ahead of me and the class behind me at, at Mayo, you've got nine different residents uh, who did nine different things. And I think that that is um, an indicator of a program that, you know, has a sort of healthy, progressive, forward-looking view on saying, you know, not every neurosurgery resident in this day and age is built the same way. Um, not everyone necessarily wants to go into the lab or, you know, wants to get another degree or wants to do an infolded fellowship, that each of those has a role for people. Um, and that, you know, the best programs, I think, and again, this is, you know, one person's opinion, but, um, and obviously I'm biased because the place that I chose to train, uh, you know, takes this sort of model, but um, I think it's very valuable when things are individualized um, and when the program is, is willing to say to the residents, you know, we want to meet you where you are and we want to figure out how to put tools in your hands to, to get you to the goals that are the most important to you. So, um, you know, my main interests are, um, you know, skull base and cerebrovascular. And from a research perspective, um, I've had a lot of interest in, in anatomic stuff, but mostly clinical, clinical research. Um, and in particular, thinking about ways in which uh, neurosurgery has, um, you know, we're working with funny constraints in, in research. So we have a lot of diseases that are low incidence. And that means that it's really difficult to do randomized trials, both because it's really hard to recruit a large number of people, and also because even if you do get enough people to agree to let you, say, randomize their, their brain operation, that by the time you've accumulated enough people 
to adequately power the clinical question that you care about, you end up in a circumstance where the, the standard of care may have changed. So we as a subspecialty in a way that say cardiology might not, or, you know, other large, uh, you know, sample size specialties might not, we really depend on observational research. But a lot of what's going on in neurosurgery research is still fairly simplistic in terms of we're looking at a lot of, you know, your case series and cohort studies and basic things like that. And so a lot of what I've wanted to wanted to do and wanted to learn about in terms of, you know, building an academic niche for myself was developing um, more sophisticated techniques for looking at, you know, data sets, both on the modeling side and in terms of how are we uh, collecting data, looking at big data things, and, and the details uh, of what I chose to focus on don't matter so much as um, one of the approaches to using your time is to say, okay, I have a particular clinical research goal. Um, I was able to, through the, the Mayo Graduate School, get a, a degree. It's, uh, I believe it's a Master's of Science in Clinical and Translational Research, but that's, that's basically saying it's statistics. You know, so I spent my first elective year um, about 50% in the classroom, 50% doing research stuff, and advice that I would give people who are interested in something similar, um, whether or not you do a degree, I think it's, it was very, very helpful to me to go into it knowing what the clinical questions I was interested in are, and to try to pick a problem that is going to be very amenable to that kind of work. So I, I happen to think gamma knife is very interesting anyway, as a technique, I think it, it helps a ton of patients. I think it's an incredibly useful adjunct to skull base surgery and cerebrovascular surgery. Um, but it also, it's probably the most robust data set in neurosurgery at large. So it was very attractive to me, both in terms of thinking my clinical goals are going to be to work in this niche where this is a really important tool in the toolbox. And it's also, this is an area where we have done a better job collecting a lot of data over a long period of time. And I'm very fortunate to be, you know, at Mayo where we have Bruce Pollock and it's one of the, you know, luminaries of the field and, uh, you know, Mike Link. And you know, there's been a lot of innovation here. A lot of people have spent a lot of time really tracking the data for Gamma Knife, um, you know, over decades and how. And so I, I was fortunate to come into a really rich data set and to be able to kind of leverage the, the graduate school res research resources um, in a way that let me, you know, both build technical skills that I wanted um, and also answer some questions that I think are very important clinically. The other research here I'm actually in right now, so as Dr. Mayer sort of alluded to, things are heading in a direction in most programs that you know, are able to do so have kind of already adapted that, you know, you, if you're going to do an infolded fellowship, you do that towards the end of your residency. So I did my chief year last year as a sex. It was uh, great that, you know, the program was willing to accommodate flopping our years so that, you know, I could do this, um, you know, the clinical time earlier, and now I'm doing an infolded skull based fellowship. And I think that that's very attractive for a lot of reasons. Obviously, your chief year is is probably the most important year of your training. You're learning how to um, how to be a staff, how to be a generalist, how to you know tackle the full breadth of of neurosurgery. But I do think that it's uh, nice that you you know you can finish that experience and then sort of focus exclusively on the areas of clinical you know interest for you that you know most of days right now I'm thinking about you know tumors or vascular lesions and you know I don't have to have uh, spine cases thrown in the mix that um, you know might distract me from uh, you know sort of developing a technical skill set that's that's more um, you know particular to what I'm hoping to do long term in practice. Um, I do think that there's value to getting a postgraduate fellowship in addition to an infolded fellowship. If you're able to do that in terms of sort of your timeline and your resources and everything else, obviously everyone's life is a little bit different. Um, you know, I'll be at Barrow next year doing an, an open vascular and skull based fellowship. And, you know, I'm looking forward to that because I think it's good to get a couple different uh, institutional perspectives on things, to have a number of close mentors that you can both see how do they think about problem solving, how do they think about patient care and decision making, how do they counsel people differently, and just to pick up another set of tools, again, for your, for your clinical technical toolbox. Um, but anyway, I know we only have a couple minutes each, and I'm happy to answer specific questions. I don't want to drone on for too long, but the, you know, I, I'm sort of like the mixed bag guy here that, you know, I, I spent one year doing, um, you know, a master's degree. And my, my recommendation, again, is if you're, if you're really interested in clinical research, I think it's very valuable to build a sort of robust statistical tool set. And I think the best way to do that is to try to identify a question that you think is important and a data set that you think is, is rich and robust so that you can simultaneously learn by actually trying to answer a question. And then as you iteratively go through things, you will, you will get better at you know, the projects that I'm designing now, the 
you know, epidemiology is a lot more uh, sound than what I was doing a year ago or two years ago. And that's, that's part of the process and that's very valuable experience. And then, um, you know, on the other side of my chief here, now I'm doing an infolded fellowship. And I think that these are, if you have them available to you, I think they're great experiences. They're a way to dedicate one of the seven years of your training to what you're the most passionate about, um, to working really closely with mentors. Like in my case, you know, I spend half of the year with, with Mike Link and half of the year with Jamie Van Gompel. So I'm getting a really spectacular, you know, operative experience and seeing the breadth of skull base surgery. And, you know, if you are someone who is very clinically oriented, I think it's a very good way to build, um, you know, as much sort of high level technical expertise and decision making expertise as you can while you're still a trainee. So I think that kind of summarizes my perspective on things. Um, and I guess the, the big take home for me is that the, the best case scenario is to try to find mentors and institutions that are going to do everything they can to both help you figure out what it is you want to do with your career and how can they help enable you to, to reach those goals. So I think I'll stop there. That's awesome, Chris. Um, one question that came to mind is just maybe we can ask each person that talks this uh, since we asked after Mar as well, is like, what was your experience early in your training setting this path for yourself? Like, you know, what was your program's plan to have you make these decisions? And at what points in your training did you make them? That's a great question. Um, and, you know, it's uh, programs change over time. You know, even Mayo in the seven years I've been here has gone through a few different iterations of what do we try to do to help people coach you know, through that. Um, right now, we're at the point where like everyone gets sort of a mentor very early in residency. You might do, you might pick up a second mentor who, as you develop a subspecialty interest, is more aligned with that. Um, you know, I was fortunate in that when I came into things, I both knew that I was a little bit oriented towards the, you know, complex cranial niche. And I had a chief resident, um, you know, Will Copeland, uh, who took a great interest in nurturing me and helped connecting me to the staff like Dr. Link and Dr. Van Gompel, who, you know, have been fantastic mentors to me the whole time. I would say that most people in our program start developing their interests um, and their plans probably in the second year, um, you know. I don't think that everyone is committed to a particular decision by the end of their second year, but I think that people are at least leaning one way or the other and trying to figure out what's going to be the best for them. Um, I didn't fully commit to the, I was going to do the master's degree thing until like I was my, what, how I was going to spend my research year was kind of an open question until I would say probably late in my third, early in my fourth year. Um, and I, again, I'm been fortunate to have access to the Mayo Graduate School, and I sort of peeked at what the resources were that were available there, and I talked to them about would they let me do the full curriculum in a year, and they were willing to accommodate that, so um, it all turned out, you know, very favorably in terms of the circumstances, but, and the Infolded Fellowship, I've kind of been eyeing the whole time, but again, that was, that wasn't, you know, I would say maybe my third year was the time when those discussions were really being solidified, and, you know, I had signaled my interest to, to the you know decision makers and mentors and all the people who who were involved in that process earlier but i think for most residents somewhere between the beginning of your second year and the end of your third year is when a lot of the decision making happens and i think that on the one hand i tend to counsel junior residents that you know there's a lot that's very different about being a resident than being a medical student and there are many things i've been surprised by um you know i enjoy doing spine cases way more than I ever thought I was going to. And like, I say that as someone who's not going into spine, but like as a medical student, you're standing like a foot away from a hole that's like six inches deep. You can't see anything. You get recruited as like an accessory scrub tech. Like it's kind of a boring day. Um, and as a, you know, learning the anatomy and learning how to put screws in and learning how to do this sort of like human carpentry, I, I think it's super fascinating. And it's been like a very fun part of being a resident. So I think that everyone should come into it with an open mind and every intern who thinks like, I'm absolutely going to be X, Y, or Z. Um, probably about half of them are right, but about half of them are going to change their orientation either because what they think they like, they don't like in practice, or something they have been underexposed to actually speaks more compellingly to them than the thing they thought that they really loved. So I do think it's good to keep, um, you know, an open mind about things. On the other hand, and you know, Ben can talk to this as well. Um, it's important to have, you know, if you're someone who has a particular like a laboratory interest or something where funding is really going to make a big difference, maybe not in terms of actually getting the research done, but certainly in terms of your long term appeal as, you know, someone who's eventually going to be trying to get a, a, a professorship in that kind of a domain. Um, 
it's nice to start the ball rolling sooner. Sometimes you need a few funding cycles to actually get funded. Sometimes you need to workshop a grant with several different people before it's in, you know, fighting shape to, to get submitted somewhere. And so, you know, talking to some of my, my friends and colleagues who are more, you know, oriented towards basic science stuff, I do think that if you're very committed to a particular laboratory enterprise, it obviously helps to get that off the ground sooner. That's a great summary. Thank you, Chris. Um, I think uh, we'll, uh, I have a few questions, uh, but we'll hold them hold them towards the end um, so we can get everybody's kind of experience in and then ask them as a potentially as a group there. Um, all right, I believe next is uh, David and then Ben will be at the end with, the, with the, the, the big Monty, the PhD, his experience. Perfect. Uh, thanks, Jeremiah. Y'all kind of walk through my uh, Kind of actually evolution and in, in my interests over the course of my residency and uh, leading into my research years and how those how they really molded what I ended up deciding uh, to do. But I'm now I'm currently in the second year of my open and endovascular fellowship down at uh, Sims Murphy in Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, I did my residency up at Ohio State uh, before coming down here, and we had a very similar model to uh, what Dr. Mara was talking about, um, where we had our fourth and fifth years were our our research research years and uh, you could do some clinical and full fellowships in that if you wanted to. Um, I ultimately elected not to. Um, and speaking to Jeremiah's kind of initial point, uh, I really started the process in my, it was really my second year. Uh, I had two full years to go before um, starting my research time, but really kind of setting that groundwork was, was instrumental for allowing me to hit the ground running once my time finally came up. Um, I started out back in medical school. I did a lot of work in a basic science lab doing ischemia reperfusion injury uh, research. Um, and there I was really just doing Western blots. I, I never touched a, a mouse or a rat or anything. Um, I got the, got the samples and then it was my job after that to kind of take it to, to, to the finish line. Um, so when I came into residency, I was kind of planning on doing something along those lines for my research years. Uh, and I really, uh, my interests have essentially always actually been in, in vascular, um, both from an aneurysm standpoint, but from a research standpoint, a lot of my interests uh, revolve around ischemic strokes. That's really what I was, was looking for. When I first started looking at the beginning of my second year, there was nothing uh, really that I could, could find that was uh, was working for me, but then I, I really got kind of lucky and the timing worked out very well where uh, we hired a new vascular faculty at OSU, uh, Shahid Nimji, and his work, his background is all in basic and translational research in ischemic stroke and kind of developing new drug uh, targets and well, new drugs to target uh, von Willebrand factor uh, in, in ischemic stroke. So uh, my job in his lab was really to uh, work more as a translational scientist uh, and to essentially do a lot of mouse surgeries is a great way to actually kind of transition or use my clinical experiences uh, in the lab um, and really, really kind of focus in on something that I already had some skill at in terms of microsurgery, but as a four, you obviously don't have a lot. Uh, and it was a great way to start to develop that more and it was a great way for me to bring something to the lab that wasn't already there. There's plenty of folks there that could, could take care of the basic science side of things that could take care of getting uh, MRI scans, getting functional studies done on these rats or on these mice. Um, but the, the clinical side or the, the surgical side of things really folks weren't doing. Uh, so a lot of my day-to-day -day work, I would come in at 5.30, 6 o'clock in the morning as I would for my clinical rotations. And I would start doing surgery on these, on these mice. And it was typically... Uh, uh, carotid cut down, causing ischemic strokes, uh, injecting thrombus uh, into the carotid and up into the MCA. Um, we also had an ICH model as well, where we would essentially take a filament and, and puncture their ICA bifurcation uh, to, to mimic a subarachnoid hemorrhage, essentially. Uh, and then from there, <clears throat> I kind of would turn the mice over to the, 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 the staff in the lab, the folks that were, were there full time, and they would uh, start to do different infusions and things of that, that nature. Really, my next job would come three, four o'clock in the afternoon to actually get these mice down for MRIs and, and uh, start to do some of that data analysis. What this actually allowed me to do in the middle of my day was piggyback a bunch of different clinical projects on the side. So I was able to do some observational studies, some retrospective reviews, 
uh, and even to do just some, some straightforward qualitative reviews, which really, while you're waiting for the basic science stuff to work, allowed me to get a, a good number of additional publications in the same same space, which was ended up being uh, great for my CV, great for my fellowship application and job application process. Um, and that ended up really kind of serving me very well. Um, the couple of important points, uh, my time during those two years was very much protected. I had essentially no clinical duties. Uh, I would cover some call on weekends, but that was about it. Day to day, Monday through Friday, I was completely protected uh, from, from clinical work, which really allowed me to be able to, to do that. I think if you don't have that kind of protection at your program, it's gonna be very hard. It's gonna be impossible uh, essentially to do something like this. Um, so that, that was very, very helpful. Uh, the other thing that, that really served me very well um, during my lab work was made essentially a lot of friends and collaborators. So in addition to working with uh, Dr. Nimjian in his lab, whenever he got approached by another uh, either PhD scientist or somebody else that was looking for uh, clinical collaborators, uh, being available, being able to just essentially answer clinical questions for folks ended up uh, really serving me well and helped me I mean, make a lot of friends and a lot, a lot of folks that I ended up uh, publishing stuff that is kind of neurosurgery related, but really it was just a way for me to kind of, I mean, meet, meet more people that were uh, of a similar mindset. So um, that and uh, the, the other thing that was really helpful for me, and I think a lot of folks uh, on the basic science or on the neurosurgery side that want to do basic science or something along those lines that really helped was being able to use clinical expertise in the lab, uh, finding a way to actually to, to do that. And it really ended up uh, serving me well, uh, just, I mean, not only in his lab, but in some of our collaborators labs too, where I would perform those same surgeries after a while, I get very facile with them. And I uh, was able to kind of piggyback on a bunch of other research projects as well. Um, I think some of the key things for me really was, I kind of got lucky, but finding a mentor early, somebody who's got very similar interests, but also has shown a pathway to success in their past uh, was, was huge. Um, and he really, he, uh, Dr. Nimji, I can't give him enough credit. He, he really not only led me during this, during this research time, but uh, he also helped me kind of figure out how to transition that into fellowship. And then now into kind of my early career as I'm looking to, to get that started. Um, protected time was huge. Um, and the other thing I would say is take advantage of the time that you have. Uh, if you have big gaps in your day, uh, definitely, I mean, keep loading, keep, keep loading the boat uh, with clinical projects as well. I really kind of, you get used to during your PGY one through three years, you get very much used to working 80 hours a week. So when I transitioned to lab time, I approached it the same way. I was going to work 80 hours a week. I was going to I mean, not work more than that. I was going to make sure I got home and spent time with my family um, and was able to, to exercise and all that good stuff. But uh, really attacking that with the same vigor that you attack the clinical side of things will definitely serve you well. Um, I took a stab at a couple different grants, never ended up getting one. That being said, I would absolutely recommend it. Uh, it's just going through that process of writing, having your PI absolutely destroy your first several sets of grants. Um, it was... Uh, very helpful. Uh, and it's something I'm planning on doing at the next level uh, as well. Um, so getting that early experience was was invaluable uh, for me. Um, and then uh, <clears throat> something that uh, Chris kind of started to, to talk about a little bit, but I think the whole part of this, especially in your early years, but during your research years as well, is kind of getting to know yourself, what you like and what you want to do. That's probably the most important thing in setting up your research years. Uh, you'll get told a lot of different ways to do things and your your chair, your program director, your co-residents are all going to have their own biases. Uh, I think it, it's very important to figure out what you like, what gets you going and what gets you excited to, to roll into work every day. Um, part of my whole process as I did all this was I really enjoyed the basic science and the, the translational science side of things. But what I found was I tremendously more enjoyed the clinical research that I was doing. Um, and it was it was very helpful for me to figure that out for myself long-term. Uh, I, I had a lot of background in basic and translational science, but after uh, kind of doing a lot of those in tandem with clinical work, I was way more excited about the clinical work. And that's essentially what I'm planning on doing at the next stage is to target NIH grants for clinical research and clinical trials. Um, and that having the experiences that I had, they not only kind of gave me a lot of the tools to do that, 
Um, they also informed a lot about what I actually like and what I enjoy and, and what I uh, really want to do at the next stage. So um, yeah, the very the last thing I just wanted to throw out there is I, I really liked on Dr. Marr's uh, conclusion slide, uh, one of the most important things that you can do is balance your goals with department strengths. Um, I mean, there's, it really depends on, on where you're at. Um, I got lucky. I was having actually a hard time doing that at first before Dr. Nimji came to Iowa State. Um, the timing couldn't have worked out better for me, but um, kind of knowing yourself, but also knowing your department and what you'll be able to, to, to pull off um, will, will make you successful and make your time way more enjoyable. Great overview, David. Um, I do have a question for you. Is that maybe a specific to vascular actually, but maybe it helps others as well. So you very early on had to make two decisions about what you, did, what you wanted to do down the road in your career in some ways, because your research ended up being intertwined in your clinical path as well. But how do you know as a PGY2 that you want to A, do basic science specifically in something vascular related, and B, that you kind of want to parlay that into a vascular career? Um, and, and that's an interesting thing to know as a PGY2 when you're setting up your experience. And then the second part of the question is, is what, did you, what was your consideration regarding, you know, most people that want to go into vascular want to do endovascular. And a lot of times they try to put in a clinical year in the middle of the residency so they don't have to do two postgraduate years. So how did you navigate those decisions? Yeah, the... The second one was hard. Uh, <laughs> uh, to answer your, your first question, kind of figuring out what I wanted to do, I came in pretty set. I did not take a good job of, uh, of, of heeding Chris's advice. I, I, I didn't have a great open mind about other things, but I came in pretty set that I wanted to do, actually initially I thought I wanted to do open, open vascular and skull base. Uh, it didn't take me very long, it didn't take me very many skull base cases to realize that I don't have the attention span to do that type of work. Um, and, uh, yeah, that, that actually was pretty, I figured that one out pretty quick. Uh, I did, I guess one of the biggest things that really helped me figure out that I wanted to do vascular early on, um, is just, uh, at Ohio state, we got very early operative experience. Um, so getting into the OR and getting to kind of experience a lot of these cases kind of helped me. I mean, it definitely steered me more towards, uh, open and, and into vascular as a career path. Um, we also, we, we got just great experience in the endovascular suite as well. Uh, it was kind of one of our, it was treated as one of our ORs. We would always have it covered by a resident. So I got some very early endovascular experience as well and loved that. And when I already knew I liked open vascular and then kind of coupled that with this new endovascular experience that I also loved, it made it pretty easy to, to hop in, hop in that pathway. Um, and I was definitely also, uh, kind of swayed by my medical school time doing ischemia reperfusion research. Um, that's kind of how I ended up doing that. I really, the basic science and kind of translational thing, I really kind of stumbled into it, to be totally honest. Uh, it, it was something that I had in my past. I had a good, pretty good, actually, experience at uh, in my medical school of basic science and, and kind of really going through not only the... Um, not only the lab process, but also the writing process. And I, I really, really enjoyed it. and knew I wanted to incorporate that into my career, uh, really no matter what specialty I chose to do. So that's, that's really, that's how I ended up going down the vascular and basic science, translational science pathway. And I assume um, if you, sorry to interrupt, but I assume if you kind of want to do basic science for your middle years, um, you kind of had an idea that you're, you're oriented towards academics, it seemed like, yeah, or no? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. I had to have in mind, I guess, is yeah, this was all going to be moving towards an academic career. Yeah. Yeah. And that's kind of always been a plan of mine. I've never actually, honestly, really even ever considered a private job. Uh, it just doesn't interest me. I, I, what I really like in, in neurosurgery is the, I, I love the teaching side of things and I love the research and writing side of things. Um, and it's hard to get either of those, much less both of them in a, in a private or a private demic position. So, um, yeah, and that was, that was really, yeah, that, that was never really a question, uh, in my mind. Um, the other thing I was going to say, uh, you're asking about the, the option to infold a, a year, uh, in kind of in my middle years, that was, uh, very much an option Ohio State. They, they are, were very happy to let you in full, especially one of the years uh, for your endovascular 
uh, fellowship during your uh, residency. And I kind of did that in a way. Um, I didn't have like a pure dedicated endovascular chunk of time. I could have if I wanted to. I just, I, I really wanted to focus on lab. I really wanted to make sure I did the lab thing right. If I was going to do the basic and the translational science thing, I really wanted to fully invest in that and to uh, not allow myself to spend too much time doing other endeavors that were going to detract me. I really wanted to kind of just jump, go all in and, and, and be successful or not, um, but really make sure that I did it, did it the right way. Um, I did though, during, I kind of mentioned before, I did a lot of mouth surgeries in the morning and MRIs in the evening with a lot of time in between. Um, in addition to doing clinical research in between, I got into the endovascular suite a lot uh, during those couple of years, uh, during that chunk of time. Um, I would focus on days where they had a lot of just diagnostic angiograms where I could kind of start to get my skills up and kind of hammer a bunch of cases out. Um, and it, ended up working out pretty well. I, I had about 300 endovascular cases before I even got done with, with uh, my research years. Um, so if I, if I had wanted to, I probably, I mean, I'm, I'm sure I could have, I interviewed for a couple of different one-year fellowships, but um, I, to my, I, I really wanted to come to, to Memphis for fellowship. It was, it, that was far and away my number one choice. And it was it's also a non-negotiable two years here. <laughs> um, so I, uh, I was perfectly fine kind of jumping in and, and investing the additional time in that, so. Awesome. Yeah, so it sounds like you kind of got both done. That's great. Yeah. All right, third third panelist here, uh, presenter, Dr. Heim. So uh, he is, uh, can you introduce yourself? Uh, I, I, I kind of, we skipped an introduction slide I typically have for the panelists. So maybe sure. just yourselves to everyone and then and what your experience was. Yeah, um, so I hope everyone can hear me okay. I'm uh, Ben Himes. I'm in my eighth year chronologically here at uh, Mayo Rochester now, um, doing a neurosurgery night school, as uh, at least one of our staff has uh, told me. Um, so uh, I'm interested principally in neuro-oncology, and I used my elective time to complete an enfolded PhD in immunology through Mayo Graduate School, uh, which we do our elective time in the fifth and sixth years typically, uh, which I did that, then basically tacked on my seventh year uh, in the lab there, defended my thesis in July, then came back to do my chief residency year this summer. And I will be graduating residency, but staying yet one more year here to do a neuro-oncology fellowship with um, Dr. Parney and Dr. Burns here, mainly focused on um, intraaxial tumors, um, motor mapping, um, kind of eloquent glioma surgery. Um, you know, the Chris and David really, I think, touched on a lot of the really key points. Uh, no matter what you want to do that I think are perhaps ratcheted up a little bit if you want to do something more complicated like this. Um, having a plan fairly early on, uh, making people aware of that plan is critically important. Um, really identifying good mentorship early uh, and I think most importantly, having a reason for doing it, being very goal oriented in your approach. I think particularly in the lab side of things, I think if I had not done the PhD, I still would be going in to the lab for two years and you know, I'm a basic science lab rat. I like that. I like doing some flow and Western blots and making some mice angry um, as opposed to doing more clinically oriented things. Uh, but so I really wanted to, the reason I chose the PhD was kind of the specific plan of what I wanted to go for. I had, a, came into residency with a pretty strong basic science background. I had done an HHMI year as a medical student. Um, I knew how to run a Western. I knew how to do PCR, et cetera, et cetera. But I had done kind of basic cancer biology, um, a little bit of bioengineering stuff actually. But um, if I decided kind of my goal was I want to try to shoot to be an independently funded investigator, ideally have my own wet lab and kind of split time between clinical um, neurosurgery in the lab. And so I thought, well, if I want to do that, 
what sort of neurosurgery do I want to do? I was always really drawn to tumor surgery in general. That's why I got interested in neurosurgery. Um, glioma surgery in particular is a disease process and surgeries, particularly in eloquent brain have always very much interested me. Um, that's very much what I wanted to make my focus. Um, and being so interested in the lab, I thought really pursuing that as opposed to say more kind of skull base, uh, approach to a tumor practice made a lot more sense. Um, and so if I wanted to do that, then well, what sort of basic science would really dovetail nicely for that? And um, I'm pretty interested in tumor immunology. That's, you know, I think we're still, I think that's an area that still has a great deal of potential to be transformative in uh, CNS and intracranial oncology and potentially in treatment of gliomas, but it's certainly a nut we've not cracked yet as a field. Um, so that's some of an area I really wanted to spend some time in. But um, immunology is not a field that one picks up overnight or picks up casually. So I was like, how do I really divide, have a more intensive training experience uh, in that area to really develop the skill set and the competence I need to write a grant that'll make it through study section without just getting eviscerated. Um, and so uh, the PhD in my sense was very appealing from the sense of protecting my time in the lab, was very appealing in the sense of providing me with the formal structure and formal kind of pedagogy to be like, okay, we will teach you to be an immunologist. Um, I was, it was pretty clear from the outset that I was going to do my PhD in Dr. Parney's lab. Um, you know, that was the plan, but I still had to go through the whole process of, I applied to graduate school, I had to interview, I had to do rotations in a few different labs. I had to form a thesis committee. I had to do uh, qualifying exams, the whole, the whole deal. Um, and that was very useful in terms of creating a strong foundation in an area of science where I had some understanding and I had the basic kind of core laboratory competencies to do the work, but having the formal training in the field that I really wanted to build into my career uh, is what that provided for me. Um, and a point that I think David made uh, about being in the lab that I think was really critical in the PhD really helped ratchet up to that next level was uh, getting connections with other investigators, uh, particularly other basic investigators. Having somebody who you've spent two months rotating in their lab and who is on your formal thesis committee, um, in terms of creating somebody who you can will potentially be on a committee to mentor a K award or be able to write you a letter or be a co-sponsor on a grant or things like that. Um, you can get people at kind of another level of basic scientists to kind of give you the time of day that it can be challenging to do if you're just, you know, in the lab for an undefined period of time. They have a sense of responsibility to you that I think is incredibly useful um, that I really got to work with um, Haidong Dong and Richard Weil who are some of the very kind of prominent basic immunologists here. Um, that I think really, um, I'm hopeful, certainly will pay dividends in the future and certainly did um, over the past few years. Uh, one thing I, I think was really critical if this is something that somebody is interested in is unless you're at one of the very few programs that has something like this arranged, there's going to be a lot of groundwork that needs to be laid. And institutional support for something like this is so utterly critical. Um, I think Dr. Dr. Marr mentioned that uh, one of his uh, residents is pursuing a similar path at uh, Michigan right now. And just the idea like, you're gonna need to extend your training to do a PhD, just full stop. That's already gonna create numerous logistical hurdles for your program and your program's gonna have to support. Dr. Spinner and Dr. Van Gumpel had to be very on board with me doing this. Um, was also having Dr. Parney, who is my thesis advisor, 
uh, was very crucial in kind of helping to navigate this uh, very well. It, um, it was a unique situation where Dr. Parney actually did his PhD in residency when he was a trainee uh, in Calgary, and so had a particularly unique perspective on what we should do, what we shouldn't do, uh, because even, you know, getting a PhD done in th three years requires a lot of planning and a lot of kind of careful thought. And even if you come into it with a pretty good idea of what you want to do, um, there's still a lot you don't know and you need somebody to guide you and really help point you in the right direction and help avoid a lot of the landmines that can keep uh, kind of regular grad students in their program for a while because you have a clock on you in a way that a lot of these other trainees don't. Um, Ultimately, I think that's actually very helpful. Um, and I think it is it was certainly the bit of the other scientists I work with during those years, I think found very appealing was that, you know, I came into it with a very clear focus of, you know, I'm interested in glioma tumor immunology. I'm particularly interested in tumor mediated immune suppression. That's what I want to work on. Dr. Parney's lab does a lot of work with extracellular vesicles, and we want to focus on how those extracellular vesicles derived from GBM mediate tumor derived immune suppression. Okay, boom, there's like the start of a specific games page um, there. Um, I did get more formal training in terms of things like grant writing and uh, things like that. I was uh, able to, you know, get an NREF grant for my last year in the lab, which um, I don't think if I hadn't had the lead time to really work on it, build up a good reserve of preliminary data, things like that. I think I would have had a lot harder time achieving that. Um, and it, it really was a wonderful experience. I mean, and I, I think, um, I, you know, a lot of people ask about it. There are a few uh, neurosurgery programs in the country that have uh, certainly more codified paths than we uh, did certainly before I, I went through it, our hope is that we'll kind of have a pipeline now of how a sort of mechanism for people that want to pursue this path to do so in the future. And there is a resident a couple years below me who's interested in pursuing it. So I'm hopeful we'll continue to do so. But um, there are a few places that will provide this option. So obviously, if it's something I think as a applicant that you're thinking about, um, you have to have that in the back of your mind when you're um, choosing a program. Uh, this was something that was offered as an option when I applied to residency here. It's just nobody had actually really wanted to pursue it to that point. So, um, but the program was very supportive. Um, I really, really prioritized uh, having two elective years when I was looking at programs. I thought that was really crucial for what I was going to do no matter what. Um, and I, I think was a really point of emphasis. Uh, the program was really great about uh, protecting my time during the three years I did spend in the lab. I was um, fully protected during the day. Um, I was not called to you know, cover elective cases, things of that nature. I did take chief call during those full three years, covered weekends. Um, that was largely my choice. Uh, the program did offer me the chance to be just completely fully protected uh, but i wanted to maintain you know certainly kind of clinical decision making skills and the like over over three years off service um, and i'm glad i did but um i do think as far as providing you the really focused approach um that in an area where you did not necessarily have the foundational expertise coming into residency that it would allow you to just run with it and do a couple years of research in the lab to parlay into your next grant or whatever. That's, I think, the, the value that a PhD can serve. Um, and I do think um, it's a path that um, I think has value for people that want to pursue a career as kind of a true clinician scientist, um, which I think there are many paths to having excellent academic careers in neurosurgery that do not require you to extend your training time and jump through all these different hoops. But I do think um, it's a very valuable subset uh, for a subset of goals. I think it's very valuable. And I think in my case, I'm, I'm very glad I did it. Um, you know, still have to kind of parlay that into the next step, obviously. But, um, you know, to this point, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy with having done it. Uh, it was a tremendous experience and I think relatively rare one. I want to come back for a question for you, Dr. Himes, but before I do, 
want to ask uh, one more thing for Dr. Marr to comment on um, listening to these, these people's experiences. One thing I realized that we may not have touched on is what do someone in their early years who does not want to do academics, but actually wants to do private practice, uh, do with their middle years, um, especially given the fact that the, the you know, cast and, and, the different, and the different entities you discussed have decided that uh, this needs to happen after your chief year to have an accredited fellowship experience. So what would someone that's not interested in hardcore academic jobs after they graduate do with their middle years with all these sort of situ circumstances moving around as, they, as the puzzle pieces have so far? Yeah, that's a, a great question. And I think, you know, it goes beyond, uh, you know, academic versus private practice has to do a specialty choice as well, right. because I think, you know, you can be well-trained um, with uh, the core requirement length of neurosurgical training, the ACGME has said so, and I, I believe that that's true. Uh, so you, just because you're going into private practice does not mean that you need to spend your elective time in the operating room. Uh, you can if you want, and uh, certain people going into private practice may choose to. Uh, on the other hand, they may choose to develop some other aspect of, of their future career choice. Uh, again, I use the example of uh, people that have uh, you know, worked with politicians and so on, which I think is a reasonable option for somebody going into private practice. Uh, we've had people that have gone to business school and got a business degree, uh, which frankly is not something that we encourage uh, anymore, but, but we have had people that have done that and have had very successful careers with that. Uh, in one case, uh, essentially getting out of practicing neurosurgery and becoming a, a, a high-level hospital executive, in another uh, case, becoming a high-level insurance executive. Again, not, not necessarily something we encourage as a training program, but something that uh, realistically is going to appeal to certain individuals, even individuals who maybe didn't see that coming uh, in advance at, the, say, the med school level, uh, but uh, change their, uh, their career trajectory um, at a more uh, advanced level. And so I think we need to accommodate that sometimes. So back to your question, if you're a medical student and you're sure you want to go into private practice, uh, well, I think you look for programs that are a good fit for you in terms of what the program is trying to graduate. You know, you've heard of some programs that are, uh, that are uh, unambiguously interested in training uh, academic people. And I think there are equivalent programs out there where they have a track record of training uh, private practice people uh, for the most part. Um, and I, you know, I think those are programs that in general are, are a good fit for people who wanna go into private practice because their training is going to be built for that. Um, if you want to subspecialize in private practice, and there's a lot of examples of, of that, uh, people subspecializing obviously in spine is the big one, but there's a lot of endovascular private practice right now uh, and so on. Then I think you, if I were uh, that uh, medical student, I'd be interested in looking at programs that offered unfolded fellowships in those fields so that I didn't necessarily have to extend my training. Uh, again, I think for a career in academics, extending your training by uh, a year or two can actually be a valuable experience sometimes and going to going to another site, uh, you know, like I think David was was talking about and gave a, a good example of that and, and uh, you know, and Chris and Ben as well. I, but I think for private practice, I'd be interested in, in uh, uh, looking at that seven year timeline and saying, where can I go and subspecialize in what I want to do and, and get out the other end and go into private practice. And that's, that's great insight. And, and I've actually, you know, had co-fellows and residents and things like that, co-residents, I should say, who uh, did years in the lab and, and really enjoyed their experience uh, and thought they learned a lot about being critical with science and what's published, um, you know, and also went to private practice after that experience and, and thought it was useful. So I don't think you necessarily have to only do one path if you're going to go into private practice or, you know, um, uh, so that's another thing to keep in mind, I think. Uh, okay, great. Uh, I did want to follow with Dr. Dr. Himes, uh, just to get, you have such an interesting experience. What is your thoughts about getting a PhD? Uh, and it just kind of needs to be brief because we have a couple questions to go over and I want to give everyone else a chance to ask questions as well since I've been dominating the questions. But what is your thoughts on getting a PhD as you know many people do traditionally during the medical school uh, versus a residency, like pluses and minuses, maybe just a few, few seconds on that? Yeah, I think so. I mean, just to use kind of our own staff here as kind of uh, exemplars, we have 
really the full gamut of people you know on staff here who've gone every way you can do it and managed to become successful clinician scientists we have kind of the traditional mstp trained uh, MD, PhDs, and Dr. Miller, Dr. Burns, among, Dr. Lee, among others, uh, who went through the kind of the very traditional route. Um, Dr. Parney, who did his PhD in training a, as I did. Um, and there's a few other examples around the country. You know, Dr. Liao at, at UCLA did the same thing. Um, uh, there, there are uh, a few others. And then uh, Dr. Daniels, our, our or pediatric surgeons actually did it in reverse, actually did his full PhD and then went to medical school and then to neurosurgery residency. Um, so that that was a, a, a choice, but the, um, so it's worked out very well for him. But I, I think the advantage, um, I, I do think uh, a lot of people are successful with the traditional approach. For me, it was obviously something I, I thought about when I was an undergrad. I've always been interested in basic science, uh, but even as an undergrad going into med school, I kind of knew I wanted to do something surgical, was even kind of thinking about neurosurgery at that point. It's like, well, if I'm really going to sign up for some super long, you know, postgraduate training, do I want to do a eight year MSTP program beforehand? Um, I ultimately went to, you know, a medical school that supported ev pretty much everybody uh, did uh, extra year of research there anyway, which was kind of a happy medium for me. Um, I do think doing the PhD as I full, um, have done it does have a couple advantages if you can swing it. I think um, it does have the advantage of now as I'm kind of putting together my job search, as I'm still putting together a few papers from the lab for my PhD years that we're hopeful to get out. I'm hopeful to carry more of what I did in my PhD time into the next stage of my career. Whereas I think a lot of the folks that do kind of the traditional MSTP route, there's such a time lag between when they completed that, their PhD went back onto clinical service to finish medical school, then went um, on to do junior residency for three, four years before they actually get back into the lab, but there's such a disconnect there. Now, I think the people that are ultimately successful um, through that route, which is most people, because that's the most common route in this, um, really mainly take the core skills in, you know, scientific method, grant writing, you know, formulating experiments, really knowing how to put together a research question uh, that they're able to then carry on to the next step. And then you have the the odd folks who just somehow, some way are able to carry on some stuff through. And I, I don't know how those guys manage to do it, but it, it happens. Uh, so I do think there are certain advantages. Um, I do think, you know, uh, the way I've done it does suffer from a small sample size problem. So it's a, it's a little hard to kind of, every, everything we talk about one versus the other is all opinion based. So, um, but that's at least my, my two cents on it. That's great. Yeah, no, it's a very interesting concept, which seems like it would, the closer to the end of your residency training, you do the PhD would be the, the science would be most relevant when you go to, you know, start your own lab, so to speak. So I think it's, Really interesting model. Um, okay, I, I want to give an opportunity for the panel to ask either Dr. Marr or each other questions that uh, I haven't thought of. Um, and if no one has questions, maybe we can answer a couple of them uh, from the audience. All right, since there's a lot of silence, if there's anyone in the audience has any questions and they wanna ask, I can probably let you do it in person. Um, or you can type it into the question and answer box. So there's been a couple that have been answered in the question and answer box. If we don't get any others, maybe we'll just discuss. Uh, I guess we kind of discussed one. One, one, uh, one question I'll throw out there for Dr. Marr or whoever else wants to wants to discuss it. This is kind of a uh, guess the future prognosticate kind of question, but uh, with the way things are now switching where you can actually do a legit fellowship during your residency years by tagging it on as your seventh year. Do you see more, I guess, more programs starting to shift to that model? It's, it's going to be hard to kind of get over the hump. You're going to have weird years. We've got double chiefs, but um, do you see people slowly starting to shift to that model just because you can, I mean, you can save years on your, on your career that way. 
Yeah, that's that's a great question, David, and it's it's really tough to answer because, as you say, you're just sort of making a guess here about the future. I, I think that the closest I can come to answering that is is just referring back to that sort of informal straw poll that we had at the SNS meeting a couple of years ago, where we discussed this issue of the enfolded fellowships moving into PGY seven. Um, only and PGY7 only, and discussed whether or not uh, residency programs were going to all change to to reflect that. And there were people, uh, frankly, that were in favor of that and thought that all programs should change uh, to do that. And then there were other people on the other side of that argument uh, that really thought that that we should not. It sort of reminds me of the situation in neurosurgery. Um, you know, uh, 20 years ago, uh, when we had some programs that were that were six year uh, training programs and some programs that were seven year training programs. And it wasn't always predictable, uh, you know, which were six and which were seven, you, you might guess that the, the more private practice oriented programs were the six year programs and the more academic programs were the seven year and that wasn't always true. Actually, there was sort of no rhyme or reason to it almost, I think, as a observer to which programs were six and which programs were seven. Well, well, now in the current landscape, we have some programs that are changing and are moving their chief year to six and, uh, and then moving a, a, you know, the elective or unfolded fellowship year to, to seven, like, like Chris was talking about uh, with his experience at Mayo and some programs that, that are not. Uh, and I think my guess, and I admit this is just a guess, I think that the programs that are going to change either already have changed or are very much in the process of changing. Um, and I think the programs that haven't changed yet are probably uh, not very interested in changing. And the only reason they would change um, is if there's a, a, a change on the level of ACGME. Uh, like for instance, if we go back to uh, only a mandated six year training period, which we don't have right now. Uh, I think that a lot of programs are uh, really like the two years of academic development time where they are feeling like it's very important to have protected two years in a row um, as part of their their culture. Uh, and I think the only thing that would change that, as I said, is something happening um, above the program level, like in the ACGB level. My best guess is that's not going to happen. So that, therefore, my best guess is that the landscape five years from now will be very similar to what we have right now, which is that some programs are doing it and some programs are not doing it. And that's, that's probably good and healthy, right? That, that programs are deciding what's best for themselves and, and their own residents because they, you know, we're all serving sort of different constituencies uh, with respect to what our goals are. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, I mean, it, you kind of actually alluded to it before, but talking about kind of the, uh, the, the culture at Michigan and, and kind of I mean, it's obvious it's a very academically oriented culture where a lot of the trainees end up going that route. And I think what, at least what I've noticed over the last couple of years is you know, even more so than I did when I was on the med school side looking in, but the programs have very different uh, cultures and very different personalities. Um, and I think it is actually helpful to have multiple different types of personalities in different programs because med students are obviously not all cookie cutter made the same way. So it's nice to have a little bit of variety out there. Um, I mean, I think a lot of a lot of a lot of neurosurgeons probably look at it as there's a lot of different ways to skin a cat. My way is the right way, and everyone else is wrong. But uh, <laughs> I think at the end of the day, it's helpful to have multiple uh, multiple different ways to do it. All right, that's excellent. I, I think we're getting close to the time. If we have any quick questions, if not, I can kind of close things up. All right, awesome. I wanted to um, kind of go back to the beginning and say in conclusion, kind of the idea of this episode was really to get people who were in medical school and junior residency to think about this as early as possible and kind of highlight the importance of thinking about this early uh, because you may find that it gets a little bit too late for some things you want to do uh, if you don't think about it early. Secondly, I think something that I've even learned and, and would probably agree with something Dr. Marr mentioned was that you may want to think about this even as a student when you start looking at programs. And I know it's hard to project what you're going to do as an attending when you're a student sometimes, but if you know that, or at least have a suspicion of that, you may want to target certain programs that have setups that will help you achieve those goals, even as a medical student level. Um, so hopefully that's helpful to people as well. Um, I want to kind of share my screen again and close uh, with a few slides here. All right, um, before we close, I wanted to thank uh, Dr. Anna 
Uh, she does a lot of the behind the scenes work, often answers a lot of the questions from the audience, but since there are very few, she hasn't had a chance to get on and speak, but she does a tremendous amount of work to make sure that this happens every, every uh, few weeks. And I wanna uh, make sure I acknowledge her. The next webinar episode is actually gonna be next week. It's a special edition, uh, which will be uh, co-hosted by Dr. Dornbos again, but this is, in, is also in collaboration with, um, with the CV section and Young NIR. Um, this will be uh, next, next Thursday, and we'll be talking about it on social media shortly. So stay tuned for that one. Uh, just follow us on social media if you wanna see that. Also a lot of complimentary information to what we talk about here. We also cover in our podcast, which the WNS and the Medical Student Neurosurgery Training Center uh, co-hosts co this with, uh, co-runs co this endeavor. So please take, take a look at that if you want more information along these types of lines. Um, we also want to say how proud we are of our former WNS staff who worked with Young Neurosurgeons Committee for many years and has recently retired. And we started a NREF Honor Your Mentor Fund with the funds that go into this uh, um, fund coming out eventually to help support medical student involvement in national neurosurgery and our committee uh, and mentorship. So please, if you have anyone that is interested to donate or uh, just spread the word about it, um, that's a great, a great cause. Finally, all of these episodes that we've done, this is the 11th one, um, after a little light editing, get posted to YouTube, the NREF YNC webinar series YouTube uh, sub-channel, um, or just Google YNC NREF YouTube, uh, and you'll find it. Um, so if you wanna go back and watch this again later or share it with friends, it'll be linked there and we'll share it on our social media also. Uh, I really wanted to thank all of our guests, Dr. Marr, Dr. Himes, Dr. Grafeo, and Dr. Dornbos, as well as Becky Schur, who and Anna, who do so much of our hard work to get this going. Uh, and thank everyone who is watching, and hopefully this is helpful to everyone and helps people plan for their futures more effectively and going forward. If you have any ideas or feedback, we have a Gmail uh, account, which we check, um, and happy to take that. Uh, and with that, I really wanna thank everyone who gave their time to, to make this possible, and hopefully it's helpful. And we will sign out from here. So thank you, everyone.